if we think about things that are programmable, uh, we think about stuff that can be reconfigured in software. Um, there's, there's, there's plenty of examples in the world uh, that things are programmable, going from computers all the way to toys and all the kinds of stuff that you find in the background of your life nowadays. If you think about photonics, you think about manipulating light. And typically, to differentiate photonics from optics, photonics, we manipulate light on a small scale. So bring these two together, and then you manipulate light in software on a microscopic scale. Now, the big question is, why would you want to do that? Well, there's a good reason. Light contains information in many forms. For instance, you, uh, your beam of light has a certain power, which can be modulated over time. But it also has an intensity profile, a phase profile. It has a wavelength. It has a polarization. So there's, there's a whole lot of information just in one beam of light. And now if you want to manipulate that information, you typically go to the classical ways of lenses, mirrors, polarizers, spatial filters. And if you want to make that programmable, the typical component that you use there is a spatial light modulator. Essentially, it's a kind of display where you can modulate phase and amplitude in the form of pixels. Still, if you're working on a programmable photonic system and you want to scale that up to do really complex functionality, you really run into problems. This doesn't scale very well. So that's the reason why over time we've seen more and more uh, the move towards photonic integrated circuits. So instead of doing everything on an optical table, you do everything on an optical chip. And just like with electronics, you get a lot of benefits the moment you move the chip. First of all, it's a very stable platform. Everything is fixed on that one chip. And everything is very small, so you can put a lot of components together so you can make really complex circuits. And that generally gives you better performance, better reliability, and at the same time, all kinds of benefits like lower power consumption and a lower cost. Now, in contrast with electronics, as you probably know, a photonic chip doesn't run on transistors. You need other functions like light sources, transport of light, wavelength filtering, uh, also signal modulation where you trans uh, transform an electrical signal into an optical signal, and then detection where you do the other thing, transforming an optical signal back into an electrical signal. Now, if you take all these functional building blocks and you want to bring them together in a circuit, you typically connect everything together with waveguides. So you get this kind of circuits where your light is routed over the chip from one functional block to another. Now, in terms of principle, that's very similar to an electronic circuit where you also have transistors and uh, electrical signals running around between your transistors. Now, electronic, electronic chips have been around a bit longer than photonic chips. But if we've seen that over the years, we've gone all the way from single or simple transistors to systems on chip uh, that are reconfigurable with millions or billions of transistors. If you compare that to the evolution of photonic integrated circuits, yes, we've seen a similar growth of photonic integrated circuits where we now are getting to silicon photonics, which is a technology that really allows you to integrate maybe not billions of photonic components, but at least thousands or tens of thousands of components. And the reason that silicon photonics can do that, can make such complex circuits, is because you can integrate really high density photonic elements. And you can not do very small elements, but you can also integrate a lot of those. And that's thanks to the fact that silicon as a technology and as a material is compatible with the same manufacturing infrastructure as electronics. So it can be fabricated in a CMOS path. And potentially, it gives you really complex circuits that can be fabricated on compact chips in high volumes at a low cost per chip. Now, a silicon photonics platform uh, comes in many flavors, but the, the many silicon photonic platforms around the world are, all look a bit similar. And I use as an example the one from iMac here where you have uh, not just waveguides, but also modulators, germanium photodetectors, multiple layers of metal. And in the end, even with the, all their little different variations, the fabrication process of these different photonic circuit, <coughs> sorry, platforms around the world is all very similar. So you start with a silicon and insulator wafer, which is a silicon substrate that two, three micron thick layer of oxide, and then a thin layer of silicon 
in which you can make your waveguides. And these waveguides are defined by spin coating a sensitive resist onto your wafer, illuminating a pattern that you want to uh, fabricate onto your photoresist, and then using the exposed patterns to define the parts of the silicon that need to be removed or need to remain so that you can use an etching, pla uh, a plasma etching process to remove the, locally the silicon. And then finally, if you strip your photoresist, you end up with your waveguides. And you can repeat this process, for instance, to make shallow edged grating couplers or shallow rip waveguides that you can use then for modulators. Now to make modulators or active devices, you need to add some electrical functionality. And this is done using doping. So you do implantations of P and N dopants to create junctions, to create resistors into your uh, chip. For detectors, it's a bit more complicated because there you need to introduce germanium as a material. So the way that is typically done is using uh, heteroepitaxy. So you make, you, you cover your uh, silicon circuits with oxide, you planarize it, you open the windows where you want the detectors to be. Uh, and then you do a local epitaxial growth, which might require some planarization. So you end up with a germanium area on top of your silicon or inside your silicon. And then this can function as a photo detector, uh, but then you need to contact, add electrical contact, metal wiring to get the electrical currents in and out, and finally your bond pads. Now, most silicon photonics platforms look very similar to this one. There might be different variations, different levels of metal, different doping schemes, etc. But in the end, it all ends up with something that in cross section looks like this. Now, this, this type of process gives you two real important scale advantages. One is, as I already mentioned, that this can be fabricated in a CMOS valve. So you have your large scale manufacturing at your disposal to really fabricate these circuits on a massive scale. At the same time, these circuits can consist of sub-micrometer scale wavelengths, really, really small wavelengths. And the reason that this is possible in silicon and much more difficult in other technologies is just because of the choice of materials. If you have waveguides in glass, like an optical fiber, they have a very low contrast between the core and the cladding. So as a result, your waveguide mode is very extended and you typically have a waveguide mode of about 10 micro. If you increase the, uh, the, the index contrast, for instance, in 3-5 semiconductors, you can shrink that mode to micrometer size. And in silicon, which has a massive index contrast, 3.5 versus 1.5, you can shrink down, you can confine your mode in an area that's like half a micrometer across, which is smaller than the waveguide in vacuum. And because you have these very tiny waveguides and you can stack them very close together and you can bend them very sharp, you can put lots of these on, on a chip. So that means that you can put in silicon many more components on the same footprint as you can in glass technology or 3.5 semiconductor. And that's what makes it possible to really dramatically increase the number of components on a silicon chip. So now we've seen over the past decades, a kind of Moore's law on silicon photonics, where you see a steady increase of circuit complexity and numbers of circuits on a chip. Now, if you look at this graph, there's one thing you should notice, or you, 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 you should know about it. All the circuits that are on this graph are ASICs application specific photonic integrated circuit. They have been designed and fabricated for one particular purpose. And to get an idea of the impact of this, uh, this statement, let's look at an example. Let's say we want to build a photonic circuit for a data center, just connecting two points in a data center together. So we need to make a transceiver. We need to design the chip, fabricate it, package and test it. So, okay, let's, let's build a transceiver. Let's use a protocol called parallel single mode fiber. You take one laser source, you split it in four, you send each to, to an individual modulator, and then you send these four signals out to an optical fiber. And the return signal comes back to four optical fibers, directly uh, channels to four photodetectors. Now this works well, you, you basically design this circuit. But what if, you want to switch protocols and you want to go, for instance, to coherent communication. Well, in that case, you would need to take the same set of modulators and similar photo detectors, but you reorganize them in an IQ modulator and a coherent receiver. So you take the same components, but it's a different circuit. 
So you need to make a new chip. And the same story holds if you want to go, for instance, to wavelength division multiplexing, where you have four different lasers coming in. Each is modulated in its own modulator. They're multiplexed now with a wavelength filter and send out to a fiber. And the return signal also has to go through a demultiplexer into the photodetectors. Again, four modulators, four photodetectors. However, each time we need to build a new circuit, it's taking us a year to design, fabricate, package, and test it. And then you should hope that it works out of the box. So this is a very, very costly proposition if you're very eager to develop a new product and get it to the market, because it can easily take you a year, maybe two, to get a first good prototype. This is a very bad state for photonics. It's a really high threshold to start playing with photonic chips. And compare it to electronics. I mean, everyone in the room has probably played with electronic chips before. So what do you do if you want to play with electronic chips? Well, you basically start by looking for a program for electronic chips that can do the job, like a field program or gate array or a microcontroller. You buy it, one day later, it's in your mailbox. You start programming, one, two, three, four weeks later, you might have already something that you can test with your customer and check whether the customer likes what you're doing. And only if you really, really need it for your product for ultimate performance or, or power consumption, you design an ASIC. But in the meantime, you've taken one of these field programmable gate arrays, which you, where you can logically configure the connectivity and the functionality, to test your concepts. Can we do that in photonics? Is there something like a photonic FPGA? <coughs> People have been using different names for that. They, they've been calling that programmable photonics or photonic processors or universal photonic circuits. Uh, rather than preferring one name versus the other, I would like to coin a definition here. What are photo we need photonic circuits that can be reconfigured in software to perform different functions. So not just the software layer, but it has to be able to do multiple things like an FPGA. It has to be useful for multiple applications to be really, really functional. So such a programmable photonic chip or a photonic processor would look a bit like this as a black box. It's a chip where you can send optical signals in and out and reprogram what happens to these optical signals. But because Photonic integrated circuits are also really good at processing high speed microwave signals. You also want radio frequency inputs and radio, radio frequency outputs. Now, that's a very high level black box. What's inside? Well, let's look a bit more detail. You have a chip. At the top, I've drawn the optical interfaces, so you have your pipes going in and out. But and at the, 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 the right side, you find your radio frequency or microwave inputs, where you essentially, the moment your microwave signal comes in, you send it into a high speed phase modulator, which basically encodes this microwave signal on top of an uh, optical carrier wave. So inside the chip, everything is optical. And only if you need your microwave signals at the output, you can convert them back into microwave signals using photodetectors. Now at the heart of this chip is this big uh, rectangle, which we call a programmable all-to-all scatter matrix. This magic box is what makes a, photo a programmable photonic chip work. Now, what does it do? Well, it's a scatter matrix. So it describes the coupling between all ports uh, using like a matrix element. So it's a linear coupling. Um, it all, that means that it also uh, contains reflection, so you can couple back to the port that you come in. Uh, these scatter matrix elements can be wavelength dependent. And it's important to note that these are complex numbers because your signals, your photonic signals, are not just power, no, they're amplitude and phase. Now, in the case that this, uh, all the elements in here are lossless, your uh, scatter matrix will be unitary. But this is a very complicated circuit or component to build. So let's simplify it a little bit. Let's look at a programmable input to output scatter matrix, but we really like a set of inputs and a set of outputs. So we make already a distinction between what is input ports and output ports. Now, in this case, this can be described by a unidirectional transmission matrix because we can assume that there's no reflection back into the input. 
It's still complex numbers, but in most cases, in most implementations, the path lengths in this uh, circuit can be balanced. So in terms of wavelength dependence, it's fairly wavelength independent. Now, how will this, uh, how can you make such a program with input to output scattering matrix? Well, the concept is not entirely new. Already in the 90s, there was this proposal by REC from the uh, University of Hindenburg, uh, where uh, you basically combine the set of tunable phase shifters, these are the thin lines, and tunable beam splitters, which are the thick blocks. And by tuning each individual beam splitter and phase shifter, you can now construct a linear transformation that maps the inputs onto the outputs. Now, the idea has been laying dormant for quite some time because of, it was not very practical to implement all these tunable phase shifters and beam splitters. However, in 2013, David Miller from Stanford came up with the idea of not just taking this architecture, but adding monitor detectors and control algorithms to make circuits or make structures that could configure themselves. And he also proposed a way to implement this architecture onto a circuit by essentially using the beam splitters and phase shifters and connecting them together in this kind of triangular uh, waveguide mesh, where at the core of each, uh, each element is what we call the two by two optical gate. That's the basic building block. Now, what is a two by two optical gate? Well, our basic unit cell actually does nothing more than taking two input waveguides and mixing them up into two output waveguides. So there's a tunable coupling element here, and there's also a way to control the phase delay. Now, the most practical implementation of this, or the, the easiest implementation would be to take a separate tunable coupling element, like a tunable directional coupler, and a tunable phase shift. Now, in practice, if you look at the tunable couplers implementations in photonics on the circuit, the easiest way to make a tunable coupler is actually using a phase shifter, but inside a Maxander interferometer. So to make a two by two unitary gate, often the easiest way to do it is to make a Maxander interferometer and add one phase shifter to control the coupling, and then one other phase shifter in some other position to control the phase. And this allows you to do already quite interesting operations. Let's take, for instance, one such optical gate. And now add a photo detector at the output of, at one of the outputs. We can now use that photo detector to control the phase shift and the tunable coupler to optimize the power that goes out into output two. Essentially, we want all the power to go out there. So the first thing we do is to tune this phase shifter so that it gets an anti-phase when the two beams of light mix and that the light as much as possible cancels out in the photo detector. But it doesn't fully cancel out. To do that, you need a second feedback loop that controls the tunable coupler to make sure that the balance between the two inputs is such that in output one, they cancel out completely. And that means that we now, because we can assume on first uh, app uh, approximation that this is lossless, that we have configured this gates that do have all the outputs, all the light and output too, without doing any calculations. We just minimize or maximize the power in the detector. And you can now cascade such gates together into larger circuits. So for instance, if you send in some beam of light or some configuration of phases and amplitudes called an input vector, we can now configure this larger circuit such that everything ends up in output four. By first doing a feedback loop on the first gate, to minimize the power in output one, then perform the same operation on the second gate to minimize the power in output two, and then finally perform the operation on the third gate to minimize the power in output three. And as a result, by sequentially performing this operation, we end up with all the power in output four, again, without doing any calculations. So now we have this vector of light with this, this configuration of phases and amplitudes will only couple to output four and nothing will end up in waveguides one, two, and three. Now, if you would inject another vector, that light would go into waveguides one, two, and three. And so it might make sense to use a transparent detector instead of like a detector which detects only a small fraction of the light and lets all the, all the rest of the light go through. 
So we can use the second row of these gates to process any vectors of light that are orthogonal to our first vector. And we can repeat that until we build a full triangular mesh, like the one that originally was proposed by Rex and Miller. Now, the first implementations of such a mesh uh, were done by the University of Bristol in glass waveguides. And one year later, we demonstrated one in silicon, which was much, much smaller. But in our case, it was only four ports. The glass one was in six ports. And we demonstrated exactly this algorithm to optimize all the power into one output using this circuit. So we just illuminated all the inputs with a fiber, no control of phase whatsoever uh, on that input. And then we basically let this algorithm run continuously. And even when we change the temperature of the chip or the, or the room, the algorithm by con con running continuously, it reconfigured the chip continuously to make sure that all the light ends up in output one and stays in output one, which is seen by the blue curve at the top where the feedback control is on. Now you can also use that not just for four physical inputs, but you can also use that to disentangle four different modes in a multi-mode waveguide, which is was what was done by uh, the group of uh, Andrea Meloni uh, at the Polytechnical of Milan. Now this is also four inputs circuit. If you want to scale this up, this is what happened next. So in 2017, MIT demonstrated this very large circuit with 26 inputs, 26 outputs. And we already see that this requires quite a lot of electrical connections. So it, because it uses 176 phase shifters. Now the triangular lattice and all of these were uh, basically triangular uh, is only one arrangement. You, uh, alternatively, you can use a, a square kind of arrangement which requires fewer gates to get to the same operations but which is much more difficult to configure. Now, in any case, why would you why would you use these kind of circuits? What what's the usefulness of these circuits? Well, I uh, I already mentioned that you can describe the input of light as a vector. Essentially, every amplitude and phase gives you a complex number, and your output of light likewise can be described as a vector with complex numbers. So that means that you do a transformation from a vector with complex numbers to another vector with complex numbers which essentially means that your circuit acts as a matrix. So you get a matrix vector multiplication that's executed in real time because the time that it requires for the light to propagate from one side of the circuit to the other side of the circuit essentially performs this vector matrix multiplication. And this is a very useful operation. It's essentially the operation at the core of most pattern recognition algorithms, including machine learning and artificial neural networks. On top of that, it's a core algorithm if you want to do linear quantum optics. But in that case, you would build such circuits using single photons. And so it's not surprising that most of the publications that have shown this kind of forward-only circuits uh, focus either on quantum, op quantum optics or on accelerators for machine learning. Now, it's important to note that all these examples these uh, forward-only circuits, they're always made for one particular application. So they are not really what you would call a generic circuit. They're programmable, but so the transmission can be programmed, but they're not generic. So they don't really tick all the boxes of the definition that we set, up, set out up front. So what are the limitations? Well, first of all, there's a strict separation of inputs and outputs. So you can't just remap your input and output ports. It's also in these type of circuits, it's very difficult to implement delays. And delays are an essential requirement to build optical filtering circuits. So what's missing in these programmable forward only circuits is delays, way to do feedback, which basically gives you wavelength filtering and dispersion engineering. And those are the type of functions that you need to do processing of time signals, like integration or differentiation and essentially turn your photonic circuit into an analog signal process. So in order to realize that, you would need to go back to our original proposition, which is an all-to-all -all scatter matrix. Now, how to implement that? Well, there, there's a couple of uh, propositions already in 2015 and 16 of how to, how to do that. Essentially, you take your waveguides, 
and you now put them or organize them in loops. So light is no longer propagating from left to right, but propagating in loops. And then you couple these loops together. So you can now couple your uh, light from any port to any other port in your circuit. And the interesting thing is that the basic building blocks for these recirculating meshes are the same two by two optical gates that we used before. So now in such a recirculating mesh, you can just start routing your light through your mesh arbitrarily by switching your tunable couplers from bar to cross stick. You can do uh, even route it back to its own input. You can do multiple routes. You can even route multiple routes through the same set of couplers either in bar state, or you can cross them in a cross state, which is usually difficult on the classical photonic circuit. You're, don't, you're not limited to keeping your couplers in bar or cross. You can co configure them in partial state, so you can do power splitting or even power combining. And this becomes interesting because now you can build an interferometer. You have two paths that interfere. So if you introduce a delay in one path, you get a wavelength-dependent transmission. You get the basis for a filter. Alexander interferometry. And you can even route your light in loops to create ring resonators so you can also make infinite impulse response filters. So the first demonstration of such a circuit was done by the group of Cossi Capmani in Valencia, where they built a seven cell, so seven of these hexagonal cells, uh, which contain in total 60 uh, tunable elements, so 30 tunable couplers, 30 gates, each with two heaters. And uh, in this circuit alone, you can already make more than 100 different functions, such as delay lines with different path lengths. Uh, you can do actually the same type of functions that you also do uh, with the forward only meshes. So you basically assign a set of inputs, a set of outputs, and now you can configure a forward only propagation in your recirculating mesh. So it's really kind of can do the same, the same type of functions. But most important, it can do these filters. So you can, for instance, configure a double Maxander interferometer. And because everything is tunable, the phases and, and, and coupling coefficients, you can configure the, the width of the passband, the extinction ratio. You can also do new types of filter uh, architectures, like this tree path array waveguide grating kind of circuit, um, where again, you can configure your delays very, in a very granular way. And you can do resonators. So you can loop your light in a ring and then uh, use, that, uh, use that light, uh, use the couplers and the, the phase shifters to configure the bandwidth of your ring, the extinction ratio of your ring, etc. Now, this is nice, but seven cells is only seven cells. You can't do really a lot with that. It's, it's a good prototype to start with. What if you want to scale this up? What if you want to go to many more cells? What do we need to do that? Well, first of all, these two by two optical gates, you need really good ones because you don't want large losses to accumulate. You want them to be short, have a small footprint and preferably also consume low electrical power. And then on top of that, you need quite a lot of those. So what, what can we use to make these gates? Well, the, the standard way in silicon photonics to make a tuner or a tunable element is a heater. So you put a metal resistor or uh, a doped silicon resistor next to it or above the wavelength. And in our IC50G platform, what we used for that purpose uh, is either tungsten heaters at the top or doped silicon next to the wavelength. But this, while it works, gives you quite some problems. The heaters run hot. So you get thermal crosstalk, um, you, get, you get massive power consumption, so we need something better. And for that, we start looking at what, is, what else is available. In typical, these, uh, these doped PN junction modulators that you have on a silicon platform, they're not really suitable to use a lot of those because they're long and they have a lot of loss. They're fast, that's good, but they have too many drawbacks. So we look at other materials like liquid crystals, which are birefringent, so they have a very strong effect or MEMS, micromechanical systems, which also moving silicon around uh, have a strong effect. With liquid crystals, what you can do is put a liquid crystal cladding around your silicon wave, right? And so if you apply a voltage, you essentially reorient these liquid crystal molecules so that 
uh, what the, the waveguide or the mode in the waveguide feels is essentially uh, a change in uh, a change in refractive index. But to incorporate those into a silicon photonics platform, you need to expose the waveguides first. So you need to make the wave waveguides bare and then deposit the liquid crystal, which in our case we do with an inkjet printing technique. So one example of such a phase shifter is this one, where you have the waveguide on the left, and then you have a thin electrode on the right. <coughs> and uh, depending on the voltage you apply over the electrode, the liquid crystal, which is in between the waveguide and the electrode, will switch in plane or parallel with the waveguide. And as a result, what you get if you put this in a, in a Mike interferometer is a strong phase shift, uh, where we can get like 0.85 phase shift over a length of only 50 microns, which is quite good. But it can, we can do better than that. And one alternative way to do this tuning is using MEMS. Now, MEMS in photonics, essentially movable elements, are not new. But silicon photonics makes it really attractive to use them. For instance, it's very easy to make a tunable coupler. You just put two waveguides close together and then move them relative to one another, which will increase or decrease the coupling. And you can do that either horizontal or vertical, or you could even do that in multi-layer circuits. And converting this principle into a phase shifter is also quite easy. You just have to replace one of the waveguides with a very thin beam that perturbs the other waveguide. And again, with the vertical or horizontal movement, you can tune the phase shift. Now, this is exactly what we're doing in the project called Modric. So it's a project, a four-year project in Europe between six partners, where we are building this kind of circuits, uh, but with a, with a explicit intent to incorporate everything inside our ISET 50G platform. And for that, we need to protect uh, our original waveguides, but expose the ones that we want to release and then use a selective paper HF undercuts to locally uh, create freestanding waveguides. And this makes for very beautiful SEM pictures. So you get these freestanding rip waveguides, freestanding strip waveguides. And what you see here is also this ski that you see uh, extending from the waveguide is essentially one of these side beams that we use as a phase shift. So we, we, have, we have essentially a, a 16 micron length long waveguide and then a thin silicon beam next to the waveguide that is suspended using these folded springs, which can then be moved using a comb drive actuator by applying a voltage. And in simulation, we find that this device should give us about a pi phase shift for 30 volts actuation. In reality, the, the fabricated device did even better, and we got a pi phase shift for 20 volts, which puts this device really at the top of the line of uh, uh, photonic phase shifters in terms of power consumption and insertion loss. It could be even better. This is uh, another example of a MEMS phase shifter is by the company Light Matter, which was published only last week, uh, where they have these very thin silicon beams next to the waveguide, which are essentially moved in uh, into the waveguide. And this works with a 40 micron length phase shifter and one volt actuation, they could already get a two pi phase shift, which is really state of the art. Now, just like you have these phase shifters, you can also make tunable couplers. So you would basically suspend the directional coupler like this and then uh, connect it to the comb drive so it can be moved or to a vertical actuation. So you, you for instance, have this, uh, this cascade of directional couplers, which couples light from the input to the drop port. But if you pull, the coupler down to the substrate, it no longer couples to the drop board, but it goes all the way to the pass board. So in this way, you have a very easy way to uh, actuate your uh, your MEMS devices. And this, this is an, an example of a fabricated device where we do see indeed that we get a very good switching between the drop board and the pass board uh, as a function of voltage. Now, these MEMS devices, you have to be careful with one thing. They're exposed, they're freestanding. So any mechanical perturbation will damage them. So as a result, we also included a, a silicon sealing technique that we could apply on a large scale uh, on, on many devices over a large circuit on the wafer, uh, but hermetically sealing the MEMS inside. 
So you, we use essentially these metal ceiling rings as uh, a bonding interface and then put these silicon lids on top of them, protecting the MEMS, but still making sure that we can access the electrical and optical interfaces of the grating coupler and the bond plants. And these devices work really well. So it's essentially, we've, we've tested the, the vacuum sealing quality and it keeps, it, it's very, very stable. Now, a second part of once we have these gates, these MEMS gates or liquid crystal gates, we need to make, put a lot of them on a chip. So we need to make sure that everything is, has electrical interfaces and driving circuits and that we know what is going on in the chip. So these control challenges uh, are a challenge in their own right. So not only you need for every phase shifter and every tunable coupler, a digital to analog converter and a controller, but on top of that, you need to be able to uh, read out what is going on inside your circuit and based on that, decide on how to control the behavior of your circuit. Now we saw in the forward only circuits that this could be fairly simple. You have these feedback loops, but in, a recirculating mesh, it's more complicated because your light can not only flow in two directions, but you can also have power buildup due to resonances, or you could have multiple wavelength paths. So how do you control uh, this recirculating mesh? This is not trivial, and this is not a problem that's already fully solved. One, one big question, for instance, is just like, where do you put in this mesh, where do you put monitor detectors? Like the transparent detectors that we mentioned earlier. There's many places, even in one node, where you can put all these monitors. And you can't afford to have hundreds or thousands of monitors because you need to read out all of them. So picking the places where to put the monitors and, and how to control or use them to control your uh, optical gates, that's still a very much an open question. Now, on top of this local control layer, you need to have algorithms that help you define circuit functionality. So I want to construct a filter or I want to construct a switching ne uh, network. How do I do that? So composing a circuit in these meshes is also not trivial. And then finally, you need a layer on top of that that keeps track of the quality of the circuit that makes sure that the circuit does not degrade, that detects if there's a component failing in your circuit and that can re help you reroute the circuit. So the design of functionality in a programmable photonic circuit is very different than designing a photonic chip. In a photonic chip, you design your layout of your waveguides, or maybe if you're designing a larger circuit, you're using reusable building blocks from a design kit. But in a programmable photonic circuit, you're not designing the chip anymore. You get the chip, you buy it off the shelf. You now have to design the state of each copper and the routine needed to make sure that the, the circuit performs its uh, intended functionality. So that creates an enormous opportunity for generating new types of design techniques, like technique to translate an, an application specific circuit layout into a strategy to program your programmable photonic circuit or to control it. And on top of that, once you have these programmable building blocks, you could reuse these programmable cores into your application specific circuits, for instance, to replace a fixed element with a programmable element. Now, such programming algorithms and configuration algorithms, they, they, they do not exist or yet, or at least in a very primitive form. So we have been working on some uh, way to use graph techniques, so like network graphs, but to use them to program our photonic circuits. So the first thing we did was try to do a physical mapping of our network, of our circuit, into graphs in such a way that the physics of the photonic waveguides is respected. So that light, for instance, cannot just go back and forth in directions that are not allowed. So we came up with this representation of a two by two coupler. And this allows us to now unleash all these existing graph algorithms, for instance, for network routing, to use them on our program with photonic circuit. So in this case, we could route the, the paths through the circuit by just uh, reconfiguring on the fly the different paths. Now, other routing techniques or programming techniques could, for instance, look at, uh, at uh, distribution trees, like in this case, splitting your light into six equal parts. And you can do that with different constraints. In this constraint, we wanted to minimize the number of gates that we use. While in this constraint, we want to minimize the power in the waveguide. So we started splitting as soon as we could. 
so that you minimize the power in waveguides to, for instance, limit nonlinear losses or to photon absorption. So this shows that your programmable photonic system is not just your photonics. It's photonics, but you need the electronics on top of that, both analog and digital, and the software layers. Without that, you don't have a full programmable photonic system. And then everything needs to be brought together into physical packages, like with your optical and electrical interfaces, with a light source, with microwave interfaces for your high-speed signals that have to go in and out. And on top of that, you need then the software stack to put in the hand of a developer so that he can program these feedback loops and that he can debug the functionality of the circuit. In that way, you get something similar as what you would get with a field programmable gate array or a microcontroller. So this entire technology stack, it's far from complete. It's not just the, the photonic chip, it's all the other things that go on top of them. But once you realize that, and you, you get a photonic processor like that, you suddenly can realize quite a lot of uh, functionality. For instance, just to go back to our original example, you could have your four input fibers, four output fibers, and route them in such a way that you basically get your Max Zender modulators and then your four channels to your four fibers to realize a PSM4 uh, transceiver. And similarly, you can, uh, for the output fibers, uh, realize the, connect them to the correct photodetectors. But you can just as well, just in software, by reconfiguring the circuit, you can configure it as an IQ modulator by carefully balancing the path lengths and a 90 degree hybrid using your same laser as your local oscillator to build a coherent receiver. And because in a recirculating mesh, you can build Maxander deformatives and ring resonators, you can make these filter banks, like with, for instance, double ring resonator, to build a wave like multiplexer, or for the receiving part, a demultiplexer that separates these four wavelengths and sends each to its own detector. But you're not limited to transceivers, of course. I mean, you could very easily use this as a switch by just connecting the correct fibers at the inputs to the correct fibers at the outputs by routing the light. Or you could use it as a beam forming circuit where you come in with uh, your laser, you split it up into, in this case, eight different paths, but it could be many more. And each path goes through a phase modulator and then sends to the grating couplers, which can be used as antennas. So and that way you can control the beam uh, direction that you're steering your light. And I think one of the most compelling uh, applications would be for microwave processing, where you get a signal coming in uh, on, on your modulator, the microwave signal coming in, and then basically by sending it through a filter circuit on the chip, you can reconfigure that, uh, you can uh, improve that signal, get a better signal to noise ratio, uh, do balancing, or even frequency conversion of the signals that, that are coming in. So you basically make a programmable microwave processor. Now, the places where you can use these circuits are, are quite diverse. Um, first of all, you could think about data centers or optical communication, um, but it becomes even more practical where the flexibility and the remote programmability of these circuits comes in. For instance, you could use it in a, an access network uh, as a building hub where light is, where the signals are distributed to different fiber to the home trans subscribers, or even to legacy XDSL subscribers, because the circuit can also handle the microwave signals. And it can, at the same time, also feed the signals for a 5G antenna. You could use it as an engine to read out sensors, for instance, fiber brag rating sensors, because you can make filters in it and use it as a spectrometer, or as a sensor hub, into, uh, into automotive uh, applications. Uh, talking about cars, you could also use it as a ranging engine for LIDAR, for instance, to, to calculate the distance, or similarly to use it as a microwave uh, radar engine. In healthcare, there's plenty of applications where photonics makes a lot of sense. You could use it as a readout circuit for biosensors or as an optical coherence tomography uh, system. And, and finally, you could think about uh, applications in security space where you could have optical hashing functions or, uh, or even optical blockchains. So does such a chip give us the, the one solution that, that does everything for us? Well, yes and no. It can handle many functions. It's flexible, 
but because it's a larger chip, it's going to be more expensive to make. And it's going to typically have a higher loss because light has to go through many more optical blocks. And it will have a higher power consumption, even with these low power phase shifters. On top of that, uh, well, they're more expensive, but they might be cheaper, actually, if you look at the way they could be used. If you look at a photonic chip, essentially, if you build a new chip yourself, you basically pay for all the costs. So not just your the design, the wafer scale production, the assembly and packaging, everything. So all the costs are for you. However, if you use a general purpose programmable photonic chip, it's different because those chips would be manufactured by a chipset supplier. So essentially, that chipset supplier is providing the chips to multiple customers. So now a lot of the chip costs are shared over many customers. And just to illustrate how this actually works, three examples, like a very cheap version, uh, a mid medium scale version, and a very expensive high-end uh, photonic chip. If you would make these photonic chips with such functionality, you see that indeed there's a fixed cost and a, and a proportional cost. So you see that as you make more chips, your cost goes down. And obviously the cheap, the cheap chip is much cheaper than the expensive. Now, if you would do that with a programmable chip, that programmable chip would be more expensive because it's a bigger chip, it's a more complex chip. However, that programmable chip is manufactured in much larger volumes. So as, as you get these larger volumes, your cost per chip goes down and actually becomes now cheaper than your application-specific chip at lower volumes. <coughs> so that means that just like with FPGAs, there's a window where at lower volume, programmable photonic chip make, chips make a lot more sense than application-specific chips. And that's not even counting the fact that you don't need as much development time. Because now, instead of having to go for all these different steps uh, where you have to fabricate the wafers and the, dice the chips and do everything, which takes you easily like five months, you now only have to wait your couple of days before you ordered your chip off the shelf. So that gives you a much faster product development time and iteration time. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, what can we say? Programmable photonic chips can make photonics smarter. Uh, they, and not just uh, the fact that they can be programmed, but the fact that they can be general purpose can be a real game changer. Because you now, with such chips, you could get them off the shelf and start developing much faster. Essentially for every photonics engineer that you would need earlier to design a chip, you have 10 electronics engineer or 100 software developers that might be able to make use of these photonic chips to do really new and interesting things, not just in research, but also making new products. So there's, there's still a lot of technical challenges to be solved before these chips hit the market. So we need to get better gates, uh, better algorithms, uh, better interfaces with electronics, but we're getting there. And these, these, these things are currently really hot topics and there's multiple groups in the world uh, develop, developing these things. If you want to know more, there's a, a nature paper uh, with kind of an overview of the, the field. Um, but there's also, if you want to have a lot more details, a, uh, a programmable integrated photonics book by Kosik Rapmani and Daniel Peretz. So with that, I would just like to uh, just thank my collaborators who contributed their material to this presentation. And I'm open for questions. Uh, thank you, sir, for a wonderful talk on programmable photonics. Now request to audience, please uh, post your question in QA box. Uh, we have a um, couple of questions in QA box. I'll go through the one by one. Uh, so the first question is, uh, what about fabrication technique of photonic integrated circuit? Is it same as conventional VLSI chip? Um, no, well, yes and no. It uses similar techniques like uh, lithography, plasma etching, uh, chemical mechanical polishing, but the sequence is different and all the, the fabrication parameters are different. So, a photonic chip is typically separate from an electronics chip, but there are cases where with careful engineering, you could do both the photonics and the electronics in the same chip. But so even though it's using the same techniques, in general, 
the exact fabrication process is slightly different. Uh, okay, I hope this answer. Next question is, in order to have thermo-optic effect in reef waveguide, is it necessary to use air as a top cladding or we can use silicon di dioxide also? You can use silicon dioxide. In, in fact, most in most cases, the, the waveguide is always clad with oxide because it's then it's better protected. So you don't need air cladding for, uh, for thermo-optic effects. No, that works. Okay. And the next question uh, is from Prita. Uh, footprint of uh, Maxander interferometer is generally large. So how does the real E state and power scale with number of matrix element? Well, it's, uh, if, you have, if you have a matrix of n by n, you need a typically n by n uh, tunable elements. So your, uh, your size of your circuit scales proportional to the size of your matrix. And then the, 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 the maximum size that of the circuit that you can build is determined by indeed by the footprint of your Maxander interferometer or, or by the thermal crosstalk or by the power consumption or by the number of electrical wires that you can send out and on, on a, of the chip. So in, in general, the Maxander interferometers are indeed fairly large and there's a lot of work going on to minimize them. Uh, also, alternatively to a Maxander interferometer, you could use these tunable couplers that we've shown, and there's alternatives to that as well. Um, but in general, we're looking at the length of these optical gates, typically of, of 100 to 300, 400 microns, sometimes even a millimeter long. So yes, these are large devices. And at this point, that's, that's one of the, the, the scaling limits. Uh, okay. Uh, the next question is, is it is this photonics chip are toward realization of quantum computing? If so, how we get the optical signal to be making sense to real world of electronics? Okay, so like, like I mentioned earlier, in, indeed uh, quite a lot of these photonic chips or quite a lot of research of the, on these photonic chips is uh, in the framework of quantum uh, computing. Um, now, that being said, uh, the, the chips itself are optical. So you essentially, you essent but, but the interfaces to the chip are electrical. So on the chip, you're, you're have a, you have a single photon light source, usually done with uh, a parametric, uh, parametric conversion. Um, and then you, you do your quantum processing on these single photons on the chip, and then you detect at the end of the chip using single photon detectors, which gives you an electrical signal. So even though on the chip, the whole quantum operation is done in photonic domain, your interface to the chip is again electrical. And that's mostly gonna be the same way in, with, with all photonic applications, because in the end, your interface is gonna be towards electronics and software. So it always will have an electrical interface as well. Okay, moving to next question. Uh, how about loss compensation? How and where to incorporate gain element? This is a really interesting question. Um, so yes, because you have all these optical elements, you do get losses. And so if your circuit scales up, your losses at some point become unmanageable. So you could consider compensating for these losses with gain. Um, but where to put the gain? That's a very open question. So we've been playing with uh, we, we've been playing a bit around with where to put gain elements. So we've, we've also uh, are building some experimental circuits which have gain. Uh, and there's also been a, an elaborate paper uh, by the group of Kosik Armani uh, on the strategies for in introducing gain into these uh, programmable photonic circuits. But the answer is not clear. You can you can put your gain elements on the side. But you can also put like a gain element in every hexagonal mesh. So, not sure what the best strategy is for that. Uh, so we have a couple of more questions. I hope you don't. Sure, mind. I don't mind. I don't mind. Uh, so next question: uh, What do you mean by thermal crosstalk? Oh, with thermal crosstalk, it's essentially if you have two phase shifters, two, two thermal optic optic phase shifters, and you heat one up, some of that heat will radiate out or diffuse out and will also heat the waveguide of the second phase shift. So it will generate some crosstalk. Okay, 
next question can this interference be used in quantum computing uh, i think i just answered that one yes it, uh, it can be used in quantum computing the only the important thing is then that you uh, send single photons through instead of um, microscopic quantities of light okay uh, next is uh, for the mem switching is, is it not the switching speed low how to work around it um, yes, the switching speed is fairly low for the devices that we demonstrated. It's on the order of uh, tens of kilohertz, maybe 100 kilohertz. Uh, for the example of light matter, they claim that they can switch in the megahertz regime, uh, but there's, there's not too much data at this point public about that uh, demonstration. In, in a sense, the speed of a MEM switch depends on how stiff it is and how much mass it has, because it's a mass spring system, essentially. So if you make it very stiff and you give it a very low mass, you can make it very fast. Moving to next, how difficult in fabricating MEMS hanging device element? Well, it's, it's, actually, it's actually fairly, fairly simple. It, it took a bit of time to, to get the process right. So what, what we're doing is uh, we're, taking, we're taking our freestanding waveguides, we uh, protect the oxide layers with an aluminum oxide protection layer, and then the parts that are still free, if we then use a vapor HF, it will undercut selectively the oxide so the waveguides become freestanding. You do have to take care about a few things. Uh, you have to uh, be, be aware of what the stress is in your silicon layer, so you have to design it uh, to, make, to compensate for the mechanical stress. Um, you have to you have to do it with a vapor HF or a critical point drying to make sure that your freestanding devices don't tend to stick together and, and, and stick to each other and cannot be released anymore. But overall, the, the processing of MEMS devices is, even though it's still a bit of an art, but it's fairly well known. So the, the difficulty is integrating it with everything else and making sure that the MEMS processing doesn't damage these uh, other elements in the, the photonic uh, circuit. Okay. Next question is, uh, uh, what is the potential you see for the phase change material like VO2 integrated with silicon photonics platform for near term application? Okay, so phase change materials are quite interesting from the point of view of programmable photonics because they are non-volatile. They can You can change their phase and then they stay that way and then you can revert them back. The typical problem with most phase change materials is that the, the phases in between you switch, uh, you switch from a, a, a lossy state to a non-lossy state. And in programmable photonics, you prefer to have two non-lossy states, but with a different refractive index. So the, 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 the biggest problem with phase change materials is their optical losses at this point. But if you would have two, phase, two uh, materials with two phases that have low optical loss, uh, but a very different refractive index, that would be almost a perfect material for programmable photonics. So next question is in the continuation of STEM. Uh, is it hype? And if not, what are the bottleneck you see with this technology? Uh, sorry. Uh, if it is, okay. What a, so it's not a hype, but it's, it's much less mature than the, the typical other processes in silicon photonics. Um, the, 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 bottleneck, the bottleneck I see is indeed that, that a, a phase change material for programmable photonics, I think ideally you have one with, with low optical loss in the two phases. And at this point, there's, there's no materials or very few materials that meet that criteria. Uh, in the same question, the next is, uh, this is non-scientific question. Uh, for an Indian uh, student, the cost of cheap fabrication for the research purpose is very high. If I want to approach, say, iMac with my design or even get a standard photonic chip made, uh, wh uh, what is the weight around this? Does iMac or other European PIC foundry have a special discount for uh, research student for third world countries? Um, well, the, the normal price or the, this has very little to do with programmable photonics, but in a way it does. Um, the, the, the normal, the, the pricing from uh, your practice from the MPW service of IMEC already has a significant discount for academic institutes. So 
that's the that's the cost of making such chips. These processes are expensive. Um, now, what is the way around it? Programmable photonics, in maybe a couple of years' time, could actually provide a solution to that. Because if you have a programmable photonic chip, you can buy a standard one, like a, maybe an, maybe even an educational kit with programmable photonic chip in it, off the shelf, and now you can already start experimenting with photonics without needing to fabricate the chip. You can reprogram it. Okay, if you still want to make your custom chip, it's still gonna cost you as much. But that's the cost of making such chips. That's, that's inherent to the chip fabrication. Chips, both photonic chips and electronic chips, they're only cheap if you make them in really large numbers. If you, if you make one or two of them, which you typically need for research, they're hideously expensive. And that's not gonna change. That's, that's the nature of the, of the process. Okay. And next question, uh, what is the future for visual wavelength cheap scale photonics rather than the telecom wavelength focus? Uh, is LIFI on the radar for integrated photonics technologies? Okay, um, well, visible, visible photonics, uh, there's a lot of activities there. And if you replace silicon with silicon nitride, you tick most of the boxes that you have for telecom even, but you now tick them for visible. Uh, so people have been also trying to make these programmable photonic circuits in silicon nitride with quite some success. Um, now, is Li-Fi, or, or what about Li-Fi? We're talking about free space communication here. Uh, yes, there is quite some research going on in both silicon photonics and uh, silicon nitride based photonics for free space communication. Uh, whether they want to stick to Li-Fi as such, uh, the, the standard Li-Fi, I'm not sure, uh, but um, yes, free space communication is definitely is definitely on the radar. If you want to say that. Okay. Uh, next is, can we manipulate optical signal in analog domain or digital domain? Um, well, the optical these programmable photonic circuit they're analog processors. So they process the signals in the analog domain. There's nothing really digital about it. Uh, doing digital information processing is actually pretty hard in photonics because two photons are not very eager to interact. You need a very strong nonlinear material to make that happen. So two electrons on the other hand, uh, very freely interact. So doing digital processing, which requires a strong nonlinearity, I think in general, you leave that better in the digital and in, in the electronics domain. Uh, okay, lastly, we'll take two more questions, then we'll go for end of the talk. Uh, last question is, the what is the status of integrating source on chip? Oh, it's uh, a good question. Um, there's, there's various approaches and I could, give, I could give an hour lecture on that as well, uh, different integration of, uh, of light sources. Uh, typic typically, there's, there's a couple of approaches. Well, the classical approach at this moment is to keep the light source off chip, either bringing it in with the fiber or uh, taking a flip chip approach where you flip chip the light source onto the photonic chip. Uh, that's the classical approach because in silicon photonics, light integration of light sources is not very, very easy. Alternatively, you could go to a technology like 3.5 semiconductors where making light sources is not that difficult because basically the material is, is there, but then you typically don't have the large scale integration and the process maturity that you find in silicon photonics. So there's been a, an enormous amount of research to integrate light sources onto silicon photonics in a more scalable way. And the typical way to do that is to bond 3.5 semiconductor material onto your silicon photonics. So you take your silicon photonics, you glue some 3.5 semiconductor material on it, you make a laser in that 3.5 semiconductor material and, and that's part of, that becomes part of your silicon photonics chip. And that gluing can be done in different ways, using an adhesive glue, using molecular bonding. Uh, you can transfer unprocessed sheets of semiconductor or you can trans transfer partially processed devices uh, onto the silicon photonics. But in general, those are, the, those are currently the common approaches to uh, integrate light sources. In the longer term, but that's going to take a couple of more years or maybe a decade even to, to 
come to reality is epitaxy, where you grow your 3-5 semiconductors directly onto your silicon. And that's the holy grail because then you can put your light sources everywhere on your silicon photonic circuits and, and really incorporate them into your circuits. Yeah. Does that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, I hope this answers the question. The la last question of the talk is, uh, many years ago, there was a talk of optical computing, but somehow the hype died off. What do you think are the reasons and can the new PIC platform rekindle this field? Well, op optical computing is, is, is very much in vogue again. And for two different types of computing, well, I already mentioned these uh, multiply accumulate operations. So these MAC operations, matrix vector products. Uh, there's now a company that actually is building accelerators, photonic accelerators for this function. Called, the company is called Light Matter. Um, the second type of optical computing, which is becoming very much uh, popular now, is neuromorphic computing, where you're building neural networks on a photonic chip. Um, that's not the same, that, that's very different from the, the deterministic digital computing that you find in electronics, but it's going to be very difficult to replace that. Right? Like I said, uh, electro electronics is really good at this. You don't necessarily need to replace the electronics with optics for something that electronic is really good at. But for these neuromorphic computing or quantum computing or these matrix vector products, their photonics is, is really making a, a, lot of, a lot of changes in the, the last couple of years. So it's, it's becoming quite popular again. Um, it's about the ending. Uh, thank you, sir, for a wonderful talk on uh, programmable photonics. And thank you for accepting our invitation. In future, we'll also look for the collaboration for the next talk. And uh, it's...